Thank you for joining us as we elevate the Black entrepreneur experience by interviewing CEOs, thought leaders, innovative thinkers, and Black entrepreneurs across the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Frances Richards. How do you overcome severe stuttering and speech impediment to become an award-winning TEDx speaker, speech coach, and trainer? Well, Dr. Derek L. Noble is here to drop the mic and share his story. Welcome, Dr. Derek Noble. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I've given our audience such a brief bio. Why don't you fill in the gaps and share with our audience what you'd like them to know about you and your business? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I always like to give props to my hometown. I was born and raised in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, youngest of eight children. Um, I had a severe stutter and a lisp when I was a child. Uh, in fact, I would be in class for the first 15 minutes of the day, and then they would dismiss me to go down the hallway where I would spend the rest of the day with a speech therapist. My speech patterns were so bad, I really couldn't function in class. So I spent most of the day with a therapist. And my, my life changed one day when my second grade teacher, whose name I will not call, but my second grade teacher asked everyone to come up individually in front of the class. Uh, she said, tell everybody your name and tell everybody what you want to be when you grow up. Uh, now, Dr. Francis, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, but I also knew I couldn't talk. Uh, and I didn't want to get up in front of everybody because every time I tried to say my name, I would stutter and stammer. And this time was no different. I got up in front of the class, stuttered and stammered. It took me forever to say, I want to be a teacher. By the time I finally got it out, my teacher was laughing at me. Uh, and the rest of the students were laughing at me too. And here's what she said. And she thought she was destroying me, but what she actually did was build me up. She said, Derek, you'll never be a teacher because you can't talk. Uh, so I ran out of class in tears. I ran down to my speech therapist and in my own little second grade way, I said, I'm not gonna be laughed at anymore. We've got to work on this. So long story short, my speech therapist started working with me every day. I, I'm sure the school district did not pay her extra for this. But she came early every morning. She left late every afternoon. And she said to me, one day, the people who are laughing at you will be applauding you. Two months later, after having been laughed out of class, no joke, I participated in the NAACP speech competition uh, in Little Rock for elementary school students. I won first place. I recited the Martin Luther King Jr. speech, I Have a Dream, because my speech therapist had worked with me on it. So I got this big trophy. I went back to school and put it on my teacher's desk, the teacher who laughed at me. And I said to her the words my mother told me to say, next time you laugh at a child, you remember me. Uh, and here we are. <laughs> that is an amazing story. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for letting me share it. So tell us what your business, who is your ideal client? Uh, my ideal client is what the name of my business is um, uh, the Derek Noble Group. My ideal client is a leader who is relatively new to leadership. Uh, typically a year or less in leadership. Uh, although I do work with seasoned leaders a lot, but my primary client is the new leader uh, who has never been a leader before and they don't quite know where to start. They know they need to do uh, some things to make proud the people who hired them, but they may not quite know where to start. They get there and they see maybe 20 or 21 different areas that need uh, some attention, but they don't quite know what to do first. So I work with leaders uh, uh, to help them to navigate those first few months well. Uh, I also help work with those new leaders to help them to overcome the stress. Uh, as I know you and your listeners know, there's a lot of stress and strain associated with being the leader, whether you are the CEO or the mid-level manager, supervisor, whatever the case may be, for-profit, not-for-profit, there's a lot of stress and strain that comes along with being a leader. Uh, what a lot of leaders lack uh, that I help them with is they have the skills to be a great employee, which is what got them to the attention of whoever hired them to be a leader. They have the skills to be a great employee, but those skills don't necessarily translate into leading other employees. So I help them to navigate that landscape and to become effective leaders more quickly. What is your leadership style? 
My leadership style, uh, that's a good question. I was just teaching about leadership styles uh, not too long ago with one of my clients. I would describe my leadership style as uh, the inspirer. Uh, uh, the inspirational leadership style is one uh, that wants to help people to understand that they already have within them uh, some great leadership abilities. My job as their leadership coach is to pull out of them what's already there. Uh, I'm not the leader, and I, I don't necessarily have a problem with leaders who are like this, but I'm not the leader who likes to come in as if they have all the answers. I know some leaders say, okay, you hired me and you're paying me big bucks, so shut up and listen to me and I'll guide you <laughs> to the promised land. I don't necessarily have a problem with leaders like that because some people need that. That's not my style, though. My style is much more of a coaching style. Uh, and, and for those who are familiar with coaching, what coaches do is that they equip you and they bring out of you what's already in you. And, and sometimes that means to convince you that it's in you in the first place. Uh, I like to see people's self-confidence rise as a result of working with me. And I love to hear them say toward the end of the process, you know what, I didn't know I had it in me. Thank you for believing in me. So that, that's my leadership style. I pull out of you what you didn't know was there. <laughs> I want you to have a monologue. I want you to name this person, living or not. And this person has inspired you so much. Wow. Who is this person and what are you saying to this person? That is really, really easy. In fact, if you read the introduction to my book, I the whole introduction, the book is dedicated to this person. Uh, uh, his name was Lionel Ward. Uh, he was my principal my school principal at Wrightsell Intermediate School in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, fifth and sixth grade. Uh, he was the first black principal I had. Uh, he was the first black male educator of color uh, uh, who took interest in me. Um, so uh, Mr. Ward, uh, I was a stutterer, as I said, uh, and so I got picked on a lot. Uh, I was bullied a lot because of my stutter. Uh, and I wasn't a very uh, uh, big kid. I was rather small and I had those Coke bottle glasses. So everybody was just always making fun of me and picking on me. So what I did, I worked out a deal with my teachers. Uh, I said, okay, I'm always getting picked on on the playground. Can I just go to the library and read and just you know, spend recess in the library? Uh, Cause I didn't like going to recess with everybody else cause I didn't fit in. So uh, we got a new principal at the start of the fifth grade year. His name was Lionel Ward. Ward. And one day when I was in the library at recess time, Mr. Ward comes into the library and he sees me at the table and I was reading uh, the word. I'll never forget. I was reading the World Book Encyclopedia, my favorite book. Uh, my mother had gotten a set of World Book Encyclopedias for us at the house because she knew I loved to read. So I'm in the library reading the encyclopedia and our new principal, whom I had seen from afar but had never met, walked up to me at the table and said, uh, who are you? Why don't I know you? I don't know your name. Uh, and I, you know, I, as anybody who had uh, authority, as, as would happen anytime anybody had authority, spoke to me like that. I started crying. You know, I was just, I was just a little, you know, fragile little kid. So I started crying, and he, <laughs> I felt it. I felt kind of bad. He put his uh, hand on my shoulder and said, "Oh, okay, okay, don't cry. Uh, I know why I don't know you. The reason why I don't know you is because all the students I've gotten to know so far are the troublemakers." And you clearly are not one of those. So tell me why you're in the library instead of at recess, son. So I gave him the whole story about why I was in the library. Uh, and he said uh, words to me that I have repeated ever since then. He said, I want you to realize that you are more than your stutter. You are one of the best readers I have in this school. You're, you are more than your stutter. Uh, so he started walking the stacks of the library with me and he started giving me books that he wanted me to read. He said, OK, uh, so he started giving me uh, biographies of uh, famous black people. The first book I'll never forget, the first book he put in my hand was a biography of George Washington Carver. Then he gave me a book on Mary McLeod Bethune. Then he gave me a book on Sojourner Truth. He gave me all these black history books. Uh, he was a graduate of Howard University, so black history was his thing. Uh, he gave me all of those books. He told me he wanted me to give him a personal book report and then to put the uh, cherry on top of the ice cream. The very next day, uh, his voice came over the intercom in my fifth grade classroom. He said, Mrs. K, I want you to send Derek Noble to my office immediately. 
Now I'm thinking I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> I go to Mr. Ward's office and he hands me a sheet of paper with the school announcements. He said, um, I need you to read over these announcements and practice them because you're going to read the announcements from now on at the end of the school day. You got five minutes. <laughs> and he gave me uh, the sheet with the announcements. Now, while I'm protesting and telling them, I, I can't talk. How can I read the, uh, I'm stuttering. And he stopped me again and he said, you are more then your stutter, you're on in five minutes. And that first time I read the announcements, I stuttered my way through the announcements, but he was standing behind me, giving me the thumbs up the entire time. Long story short, by sixth grade, I was elected student council president. Uh, I was uh, later elected student body president in high school. And every time I won an election or every time I got an award, Mr. Ward was right there. So the book is dedicated to him. He is probably the person who is most singularly responsible for my being where I am. So I thank God for him. Wow, that's amazing. So you talk about leaders. Yes. And a lot is going on in our climate about the quiet quit. Yes. And um, lack of employers and mm -hmm. in, in employees. Yes. And what advice would you give someone that is leading in this climate now? Interesting. I just published an article on quiet quitting uh, for Authority Magazine, and they asked the same question. What, what advice would you give? Um, first, I would say quiet quitting, and, and I know you know this, quiet quitting is not really a new phenomenon. It just has a new title. Uh, people have been doing this for years. <laughs> people have been uh, you know, not really um, giving their best. Sometimes, they've, as we say uh, in the business, they've been phoning it in. Um, the first thing I would say to leaders in order to prevent this, first and foremost, the, the, the best way to motivate your workforce is to help them see the why behind what they're doing. Um, and I'll unpack that for you a little bit if you want me to. Uh, uh, you've got to provide motivation for them. And that motivation comes in the form of helping them to understand the deeper purpose or the why behind what they do. Uh, just real briefly, I'll give you an example. I was working with a school district in Northern California. I have been their trainer for many years now, but the first time I went there, the superintendent of the school district said, Dr. Noble, we're having an issue with our food service workers. We've done some internal surveys and the kids hate going to the cafeteria because the food service workers at all of our schools are just mean. They yell at the kids, they say, sit down, shut up, eat your food. He said, so I need you before the school year starts to make them a kinder, gentler force of <laughs> of food service workers. So here's what I did. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of it. I started the day with all of those food serv service workers uh, asking them, um, how would you define your job? How would you describe your job? I kid you not. One of them said, we put square pizza, mashed potatoes, and corn on a tray. Can we go home now? And that is no exaggeration. Her idea of her job was square piece of mashed potatoes and corn. Now, it took me about eight hours to get there. I was there with them all day long. But by the end of the day, I asked them the same question. What is your job? And one of them, as a result of our conversation, said, my job is I provide nourishment for students uh, and I help them to become the next uh, um, um, group of leaders uh, for our country. Uh, now, that, now, that's a far cry from square piece of mashed potatoes and corn. I help them to become leaders by nourishing them. Uh, so uh, and, and, and the, the good part about that story, the even better part about that story is that after I had been done training with them, after I was done training with them, the same school district superintendent who hired me called me back and said, Dr. Noble, what did you do to the cafeteria workers? I said, what do you mean? What did I do? He said, well, they're coming to work earlier. Uh, and they have demanded that we give uh, these kids a free breakfast program. In their letter to the school board, they said breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And these children don't eat a proper breakfast and we need them to be healthy and nourished so they'll be better behaved. So we need to give them a, br a breakfast program. He said, and Dr. Noble, not one of them asked for a raise. What did you do to them? How did you get them to be willing to come early, cook an extra meal and not ask for more money? Uh, and I told him what I'm telling you. I said, I help them to understand the why behind what they're doing. When your employees are phoning it in, when they're quiet quitting, 
what that really reveals is they don't really understand the purpose, the deeper purpose behind their job. My job as a leader, your job as a leader is to help the people you lead find that deeper purpose. And when you do that for them, they will motivate themselves. Um, and I like to end the story by saying that those uh, food service workers did get a raise, which I think they deserve, but they were willing to do it without getting one. So the key to quiet quitting is you have to make sure that it's an environment where people understand I'm doing more than answering phones or I'm doing more than teaching children. Uh, I'm preparing the future and making it better. So that's the key to uh, fixing this quiet quitting craze. <laughs> so what is your why and your deeper purpose? Oh, thank you. Uh, this has been my mantra since the age of 16. Uh, Derek Noble exists to speak truth into the lives of others, thereby enabling them to change their lives for the better. Uh, that's what I'm all about. That's what I've been about since I was a teenager, speaking truth into the lives of other people uh, and helping them to improve their lives for the better because that's what happened to me. Uh, I needed that when I was a child and my speech therapist and my principal provided that for me and my mom uh, provided that for me. So uh, my why is I'm all about helping people maybe to see uh, their uh, hidden superpowers that they either don't know that they have or that they have repressed. Uh, so I love seeing people blossom and bloom in ways like that. And yes. what is your superpower? Uh, my superpower is the ability to help people to see them uh, as they should see themselves, uh, to help people to not limit themselves by uh, what other people have said or done to them. Um, my superpower is, uh, and, and I, I asked some of my clients what they thought my superpower was. And what I heard from them was something that I didn't realize. They said, Dr. Noble, what you do is that you take lofty, difficult concepts and you break them down in a way that everybody can understand. Um, I, I recently did a training for a government agency on emotional intelligence, uh, which, you know, big buzzword in the business community now. By the time I got done, people were saying, you know what, I've heard about emotional intelligence, I've read about emotional intelligence, but today was the first time I understood it. Uh, so I've been told one of my superpowers is taking lofty concepts and making them easy to understand. Let's step back a minute. You had um, talked about your book. Tell yes. our audience the name of your book and how they can purchase your book. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the name of the book is Leadership Launch, Leadership Launch, L-A-U-N-C-H. And the subtitle is Essential Skills for New Leaders. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that the foreword was written by Melba Patillo Beals. Uh, for those who do not know, Melba Patillo Beals uh, is the best-selling author of Warriors Don't Cry, which is her memoir of having been one of the Little Rock Nine. She was one of the first nine Black students to integrate the high school I graduated from eventually, uh, Little Rock Central. So that happened in 1957. Uh, I met her in 1987 when I was student body president and they came back for the 30 year anniversary. So I'm proud of the fact that she has written the foreword for that book. I'm also proud of the fact that, the fact that it, it is an Amazon bestseller. It is available uh, in ebook form and paperback wherever books are sold. Uh, you can find it online at Amazon. You can find it online at Barnes and Noble. You can also find it in physical bookstores and if it's not on the shelf, because uh, it is sold out uh, from a few bookstores, if it's not on the shelf, they can order it for you. So wherever books are sold, you can also find it in libraries. And it's also at my website. If you go to my website, DerekLewisNoble.com, uh, there is a link to purchase the book there. So it's doing very well. I'm very proud of it. What about your top two mentors and influencers and what lessons did they teach you? my top two mentors and influences. Uh, well, one I've shared already, uh, my principal, uh, Mr. Lionel Ward. Uh, so, so he's number one. Um, I guess my second, uh, who would fight for the, the, the second position? Um, that, that's um, probably, probably it would be Sidney Poitier. Um, for, for, and, and I, I regret the fact that I didn't get a chance to meet him. I was scheduled to meet him. 
uh, before he passed away. Roland Martin was going to, uh, I, I've known Roland and his wife, Jackie, uh, for many years. Roland was going to set that up for me and he got sick and uh, ended up passing away. But uh, Sidney Poitier was a model for me as far as speaking was concerned. As I said, I was a stutterer. So whenever his movies came on, he was my mother's favorite actor. So whenever his movies would come on, I would watch them with my mom and I would mimic his voice and I would try to speak. I, I you know, I, I still can't do a great Sidney Poitier, but I, they called me Mr. Tibbs. You know, I would, I would, he, he really helped me uh, with enunciation and with speaking and with confidence. Uh, and his book uh, entitled The Measure of a Man is probably my all time favorite book. Uh, and he talks, uh, one of the reasons why he's a mentor and a, a great influence to me is that he talks about all the things that he overcame uh, in order to be successful. Uh, when Sidney Poitier first came to the United States, he could barely read. Uh, and he uh, auditioned uh, to be an actor with the Negro uh, Theater Company in Harlem, and he couldn't even read the script and he was kicked out. Uh, so he took a job washing dishes. Uh, and there was an old Jewish man who worked at the same restaurant. He confided in this man that he couldn't read. So at, uh, at work on their breaks, this old man was teaching him how to read. So here is Sidney Poitier wanting to be an actor, got kicked out of acting school because he couldn't read the script. So he starts washing dishes, uh, starts working with somebody to help him to read. Then he goes back to the uh, uh, ensemble company. He gets a role and the rest, as they say, is history. And there are several other uh, situations like that that he describes in this book. But the common theme is he did not let his circumstances limit him. And that's something that I've carried with me uh, for many, many years. And I share with other people as well. There are so many brands and businesses that are dominating. Talk about a brand or a business that's dominating that you admire and why. That's an interesting question. And people have asked me that question before and I don't quite know how to answer it. I don't know if there is, um, well, okay, okay. Uh, let's say Starbucks. Uh, although I'm not a coffee drinker, uh, I'm a, I, I love tea uh, and I love juices. Uh, but one of the things I love about uh, Starbucks um, is based upon a uh, personal interaction I had with Starbucks. Um, I, I live, well, my Los Angeles home is Baldwin Hills. Uh, near my home, there was a strip mall that had two coffee shops right next to each other. Uh, one of them was a Starbucks and the other one was another coffee shop whose name I won't mention. But it was a rainy day in Los Angeles. Uh, I have been to both of these coffee shops several times. They basically had the same menu, same prices and the same taste. Uh, so I'm sitting in my car in the rain trying to decide which of those two coffee shops, and remember they're side by side, I'm trying to remember which, I'm trying to decide which coffee shop I'm going to go to. Now, while I'm sitting in my car in the rain, an employee from Starbucks comes out with an umbrella, walks up to my car window, taps on the window, motions for me to roll it down, and here's what he says to me. He says, good morning, sir. Whenever you're ready, I'll walk you to the door. Thank you, and I see your face there. Where do you think I got my coffee that morning? Starbucks, exactly. And where do you think I got my coffee from then on? I got it at Starbucks. Now, I guarantee you that young man's job description did not say thou shalt walk the customer to the door in the rain. I, I'm, that was not in his job description, but he did it because he understood what customer service was about. Uh, I've had that type of experience with Starbucks over the years. So I guess if I had to name a brand uh, that I really identify with, that's the one. Because I, I do a lot of teaching and training on the subject of customer service, and I always use Starbucks as an example. So even though I'm not a coffee drinker, and, and I had a chance to hear an interview with the CEO of Starbucks, and the CEO of Starbucks said, we don't sell coffee. We sell the experience of sitting down, having coffee with friends and family. And I thought that was such a unique way of looking at it. You know, you, you, if you ask most people what a Starbucks do, they say they sell coffee. The CEO of Starbucks said, no, we don't sell coffee. We sell the experience. And that's something uh, that I think brands should strive for. Yes, ma'am. I love that. Me too. Advice you wish you had followed. Advice I wish I had followed. Um, you know what? I, I was given advice about uh, 20 years ago to start my own business. Uh, at the time, I was the CEO. Uh, I was the head of a nonprofit organization. 
Uh, I was in my 20s. And when somebody said, man, you're, you're, you're putting money in other people's pockets because of the things that you do and the trainings you offer, blah, blah, blah. You need to be in business for yourself. You're enriching everybody but yourself. Uh, and although I agreed with that, I was scared to do it. I mean, here I am. I'm in my 20s. My degree, my bachelor's degree was in English. Uh, I didn't have a, a, a business degree. Uh, my master's and doctoral degrees uh, were in theology. Now, I didn't have a business degree. So here's somebody saying, uh, start your own business. I was scared to death to do that. And I think I waited uh, a long time. It's never too late, but uh, I've been doing it now full time for about 10 years. Uh, I should have been doing it full time for about 20. Uh, so I kind of wish I had taken that advice and jumped out uh, earlier. But um, uh, as I think about that, I also think I needed those years of experience to help me do what I'm doing in business now. So I, I don't really have any regrets, but um, I should have been CEO 20 years ago. <laughs> How did you forge forward in your fear? How did I forge for? Yeah. Uh, the way I did that was I asked myself a very tough question. And interestingly enough, I got this question from Sidney Poitier. Uh, he said, uh, if you're afraid of something, ask yourself, what will happen if I fail to do what I'm afraid to do? What will happen to me? What will happen to the people I love? What will happen to my future? What will happen to my bank account? What will happen to my legacy? He said, what will happen uh, if you fail to do that which you're afraid of? He said, and if uh, the what will happen is frightening enough for you, that will help you overcome your fear. And he was absolutely right about that. So I sat down one day and I did just that. I made a list of everything that would go wrong if I didn't pursue my dreams. I made a list of everything that would go wrong if I didn't own my own business, uh, if I did not uh, write books, if I did not coach people. Uh, and what I saw scared me. Uh, I did not want to live a life of a regret. Uh, one of my favorite poems, I don't know um, the author, uh, I, I, but one of my favorite poems is, uh, he dined beneath the moon, he basked beneath the sun, he lived a life of going to do, yet died with nothing done. Um, and that was quoted to me when I was a high school student and I committed it to memory. And I've always said to myself, I did not want to live a life. I do not want to live, of li uh, live a life of uh, regret and uh, having things undone. Now, I would rather try something and fail at it uh, than to look back and say, gee, I wish I had tried that, you know? <laughs> Speaking of legacy, when it's all said and done, Dr. Derek, how do you mm -hmm. want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? Um, as someone who overcame odds and spent the rest of his life helping others to do the same. Um, I want to be remembered as somebody uh, who approached his life and his work with a degree of humility, but also approached his life and his work with a great sense of pride in what I was able to accomplish. So if, if I can be remembered as somebody who helped you to believe in yourself, uh, then as the gospel song says, my living shall not be in vain. How did you raise money to start your business? How did I raise money to start my business? Did I raise money to start? I don't think I raised, I, I uh, emptied my savings. Uh, uh, I um, went into my own uh, savings. I didn't, you know, that, that this was years before, you know, the GoFundMe and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I just, I emptied out my bank account. Uh, the, the first thing I did was I used the money I had to uh, purchase courses. I would buy uh, courses on how to be a coach and how to get coach certification and things of that nature. So I, I spent money doing that. And as a result of making those investments, I started getting clients and the business started growing. So uh, I never had a small business loan. Uh, I never had an angel investor. Uh, I did learn at an early age uh, to start putting away 10% uh, of every paycheck. Uh, that's something that I'm really glad I did, by the way. Uh, one of my college professors taught me that. Uh, uh, he said, you know, you're a believer. I always hear you talking about, you know, God and church and all of this, and you believe in tithing, tithe to yourself as well. Don't just give 10% to a church, put, give 10% to yourself. And so I started doing that actually when I was about 21 years old. So by the time I was ready to launch out on my own, I had a pretty sizable uh, savings account so I could invest in the courses that I needed to invest in uh, to get my business started. A lot of what I've learned has been uh, trial and error. 
Uh, some of what I've learned uh, has come from uh, leaders and mentors in the business world. Specifically, if you don't mind me giving a shout out, uh, David Newman, uh, who is the one uh, who helped me. I, I, I learned about David Newman through uh, the, Cal the Los Angeles chapter of the National Speakers Association. So David is the one who really helped me to learn how to write proposals for trainings. Uh, and how to get more high ticket and high fee client. So I credit David with that. And uh, then the other uh, mentor was more from afar. Uh, his name was John Maxwell, uh, the world's uh, leading uh, author and best-selling author on subjects of leadership. So I read and digested everything from John Maxwell. I was personally mentored by David Newman. And uh, I, I credit the two of them a lot with where I am business-wise. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Derek, what is your biggest takeaway from our conversation today? What do you want the audience to leave with? Biggest takeaway. What I want the audience to leave with uh, is, well, the reason why I wrote the book, Leadership Launch. Uh, you, we've often heard people say, you know, that person is a natural born leader or she's a natural born leader. He's a natural born leader. And while I do believe there are some leadership qualities that are innate, by and large, leadership is a skill that can be learned and developed if you're willing to work at it. And that's why I wrote the book. It's for people who realize that their leadership skills need to be honed a bit and they're willing to work at it. So uh, I guess what I would l want people to leave with today is even if you don't consider yourself the, the, the best leader, even if the people you lead have a lot of criticism about you, don't fret. Leadership is a skill that can be learned and improved upon if you're willing to work at it. So that's where I come in as your coach. The best, what is the best decision that you've made as a leader? It happened at the beginning of the pandemic, interestingly enough. The best decision I made as a leader, I noticed that uh, other coaches and other business consultants uh, were going bankrupt uh, as the world shut down with uh, the COVID pandemic. I decided I didn't want to go that route. So the best decision I made was to invest in learning how to do online platforms. I mean, every online platform there is. I became a master of Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams and uh, GoTo meetings. And I invested money in training myself on all of those. And I completely transitioned my business from in-person training and coaching to virtual training and coaching. And Dr. Francis, my, I, I made more money after the pandemic than I was making before that, uh, because you know there were a lot of people in my same space who didn't know how to uh, make that leap uh, from not doing in-person training. So, I mean, and, and not to knock Uber, but I know many of them are you know Uber deliverers and Uber drivers now. I said, no, I, I still want to do what I'm in business to do. So, the best decision I made was to uh, invest time and energy in learning how to uh, conduct online uh, training and classes. And now, even though the world is starting to open up again, I would say 70% of my business now is online. 30% of my business is uh, in person. And many of my clients want a hybrid, but this uh, virtual world is not going away. One thing that the COVID pandemic has done is that it has really pushed us into being able to deliver what we deliver in a virtual way. Uh, so that was the best decision I made. My, my business grew as a result. And while others were going bankrupt, you know, thank you, Jesus, that didn't happen with me. The exact opposite happened with me. So yes, ma'am. So Dr. Derek, fill in the blank. Thank you, pandemic, because. <laughs> thank you, pandemic, because it showed me that I was tougher than I thought. It showed me how to be resilient uh, and it grew my business exponentially. So thank you, pandemic. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Is there a social cause tied to your business? Social cause, uh, social cause or cost? I'm sorry, I didn't. A cause. Okay, social it... cause, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and, and part of that is uh, because of my background, having grown up uh, in Little Rock and uh, knowing people who fought in uh, the desegregation battle uh, and being a graduate of an HBCU. For me, uh, I love all people. <laughs> I love all people. Let me say that first of all. But I feel an, a, a special affinity uh, to African-Americans uh, who for many, many, many different reasons uh, just need some encouragement and need some help along the way. Uh, and when we don't have to get into the history of this country. We know the history of this country. Uh, so, so what I do is I, I go above and beyond uh, to make sure that I make myself available 
to uh, young black uh, would-be entrepreneurs. Uh, I make myself available at almost no cost uh, to HBCUs or very little cost. Uh, you know, what I charge uh, other businesses and other schools for appearances, HBCUs never pay what I what I charge others because, you know, I, I, I am a believer in education. And again, that goes back to my principal, Mr. Ward and uh, the educators he introduced me to. He introduced me to Car Carter G. Woodson and I read Miseducation of the Negro when I was in the sixth grade. Uh, and so ever since then, I have had a strong, strong commitment to providing education uh, for my people. So uh, that, that if there is a social cause, that's it. Yes, ma'am have um, talk about an attitude of gratitude and I want you to have a thank fest oh so have at it okay uh not to offend anybody else's uh, sensibilities but this is my list first and foremost thank you Jesus uh thank you Jesus thank you God thank you Holy Spirit uh, I know I am where I am because uh, God has never given up on me and God has placed people in my life over the years uh, at strategic times uh, when uh, I could have gone a different direction. God placed people in my life to keep me on uh, a good path. So first of all, thank you, Jesus. Um, thank you, mom. Uh, thank you, mama, uh, the late Lily Mae Lewis Noble. Uh, my mother, I was the youngest of nine. Uh, my mother was my first example of unconditional love. Uh, she loved me. She loved all of her children, but she she had a tendency to dote on me because uh, I was involved in, in a, a childhood accident. Uh, a, a, I was burned severely when I was a, a little kid. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the reason why was I bumped into the stove and on the stove was a hot pot of coffee. Uh, that spilled over on me and I had to have like three plastic surgeries. My mother never drank coffee again. And she blamed herself, I believe, until the day she died. She blamed herself for my injuries. So I think uh, she just really doted on me because of that. So some of it was guilt, but but it, it was all love. So, uh, but, but you know, mom, uh, when I came home in tears because people would make fun of me, my mother said to me, one day you're going to say your name without stuttering. Uh, and so every time I speak and say my name, just like I did at the beginning of this uh, uh, podcast, I always remember my mother. Uh, so I thank God for her. Uh, thank you, St. John Baptist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas, that nurtured me uh, in my faith growing up. Uh, and the man who baptized me is still pastor there. Dr. Dr. Edwards uh, is still the pastor there. So I thank God that I had a faith community that wrapped their arms around me when my mom was gone. All of those women in that church uh, basically became my mother. So even to this day, many of them have passed away, but many of them are still here. And I still call them, you know, Mama Aileen and uh, 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 Mama Susan and all of them. Uh, so I thank, I, I thank them. Uh, thank you, Morehouse, for uh, providing for me uh, an education that uh, is above and beyond anything I could have gotten at anybody's Ivy League school. And to me, Morehouse is Ivy League. And thank you, Morehouse, for recommitting me to um, uh, my love for HBCUs. Um, thank you, pandemic. We already talked about the pandemic. Um, thank you, uh, Daisy Bates and Melba Patillo Bills and all of the Little Rock Nine, the people who made it possible for me to attend Little Rock Central High School. And thank you to uh, current clients and future clients for entrusting your life and your business and your success into my hands. For that, I am eternally grateful. Yeah, you're about to make me cry with these questions, Doc. Come on now. <laughs> what do you need right now that you don't have to move the needle forward? Uh, nothing. Um, really, I, I, I'm... I, once upon a time, if you had asked me that question, maybe a year ago, if you had asked me that question, I would have said more PR and more publicity. I've learned the hard way that that's not necessarily what I need. Um, I, I, and so, but I, I don't think I'm lacking anything, particularly over the past couple of months. Um, I, I, I repeat business and uh, retainer clients and things of that nature. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a blessed man. So I don't think I'm lacking anything. Uh, th there's, there's really not anything I need. Of course, there are things that, that I could always, uh, you always want. You know, I, I wouldn't 
Uh, I wouldn't mind having a nice uh, home on the ocean in Hawaii. I'm not there yet. Uh, so I'll settle for Mexico, which is where I am now. I have a beautiful home here in Mexico. But yeah, I, I don't think there's anything that, that I'm lacking or anything that I need. I, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm content. And what does self-care look like for you, Dr. Derek? Good question. Self-care for me looks like uh, divorcing my longtime love Oreo cookies. Uh, I was, <laughs> I got to the point where I was really, really unhealthy and I was pre-diabetic and I was overweight. And my doctor just uh, had a, what we call a come to Jesus meeting with me and said, no, you are uh, very unhealthy. Um, and if you continue this, you'll be dead within a year. Uh, and that woke me up. Uh, so I, I subsequently lost 45 pounds and have kept them off. Um, uh, health Self-care to me looks like moving my body at least 30 minutes every day. Uh, sometimes that means going to the gym and working out and lifting. Sometimes that means uh, walking on the uh, treadmill. Sometimes that means working on the elliptical machine. Sometimes it means just walking through the neighborhood. But I move my body uh, every day for at least 30 minutes. And a lot of times it's a full hour. Uh, so I, I enjoy that. So that's what self-care looks like to me. Self-care also looks like uh, not uh, no longer having a cabinet filled with cookies and cakes and pies and things of that nature. Uh, I still have a sweet tooth, but I've learned that I can get that from fruit. Um, and I, 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 I can honestly say I joke about it, but I can honestly say I don't miss uh, all the sweets. Uh, you know, a cold grapes do for me what Oreo cookies used to do for me. So uh, I plan on being here for a long time and I've got to take care of my body. And so self-care means that. Self-care also means are recognizing the cues that my body sends me. There are times when my body lets me know it needs a break. We need uh, to just sit down for a while. We need a nap or we need a, a weekend getaway. I've learned to listen to my body. Uh, and so when I'm feeling fatigued or uh, when I'm not feeling inspired, it's time for me to get away and break away. So self-care means uh, taking care of myself physically and not feeling guilty about, there. Also, uh, about that. Also, self-care means learning how to say no and not feel guilty about saying no. Because sometimes those of us who love to help people help people to the point where we give all that we have and we have nothing left for ourselves, and that's not healthy. Uh, as I often share with people, when you uh, fly on an airplane, something some of the advice they give you that sounds uh counterintuitive they say if you're flying with a child put your mask on first and then put the now, now that sounds selfish on the surface you know, well i'm I, should not take care of my kid no if you're not in position uh to take care of yourself you won't be able to take care of your child so put your mask on first that's what self-care looks like so every day uh, i put my mask on first uh, metaphorically so i can take care of other people yes ma'am what problem exists in the world today that you would like to solve? Gosh, which one do I choose? Um, I'm torn between gun violence uh, and police violence toward people of color. Uh, and I would probably rank both of those um, as number one. Uh, I could say so much about that, but but I, it's it's heartbreaking to me to have to walk through my own neighborhood and worry that a police officer is going to come up to me and ask me who I am and where I'm going. And maybe they don't like the tone of my voice. Maybe they don't like, they don't like the bass in my voice. And I end up being uh, a movement and with people crying at my grave. Uh, it hurts me. It doesn't just hurt me. It angers me. It ticks me off that after all of our struggle and fight, we still have to deal with the fact that our black skin is considered a weapon. How can I be disarmed when you see my skin as a weapon? Um, so uh, I, I've gotten to the point where I can't even watch the news reports anymore. You know, another black person was killed. Another black person was shot by police. I can't even watch them anymore. Uh, I feel like I'm suffering from PTSD uh, in this country. Um, so the, the, and, and I don't know if I knew how to solve that problem, um, I'd be a much wealthier man, but I, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if America, if the United States of America will ever get over its um, uh, inherent, inherent racism. I don't know if this, because this country was built on um, a legacy of supremacy of one race over the other. I and mean, uh, people came over and kicked people off this land and then said they discovered it. How do, you, how do you discover something that somebody's already living on? This country was built on a foundation 
of uh, racial superiority and racial inferiority. So I don't know if we'll ever get past that. And also in with the other issue, uh, America has become so fascinated with guns. Uh, and we I don't know how uh, we have painted Jesus as this conservative Republican who wants you to keep your uh, military grade weaponry. That's not the Jesus I know, but we have painted uh, Christian belief as, you know, you have to fight for your gun rights. Uh, it is a sick country that is more willing to fight about drag shows than it is to fight about children being killed daily in our schools. I'm glad uh, that the ones I raised are adults now because I would have to homeschool. My, I, I am so afraid for America in so many ways with the gun violence and the violence toward people of color. Um, I don't know what to do about it, uh, but but wrap my arms around those people who are dealing with it and pray with them and pray for them. If you conducted this interview, what is the one question you would have asked yourself? I want you to ask the question and answer it. Hmm. What didn't you ask me? Uh, you covered just about everything. Um, what would I have asked myself? Um, um, maybe I would have asked, um, well, no, 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 you asked that question. I was about to say, maybe I would have asked, what is your biggest regret? What's your biggest mistake? Uh, but but you asked me that. You, you said, it, 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 in a different way, you said, is there a decision that you wish you would have made earlier? So, um, uh, other than that, I can't think of anything that uh, or maybe other than uh, who's your uh, all time uh, favorite sports team. You know, I'm a sports lover. So you didn't say anything about my Lakers, my Clippers or my Dodgers. So I probably would say, Derek, let's talk about sports a little bit. Uh, and after your sports question, uh, who's your favorite artist of all time? And that would be Stevie Wonder. Uh, so but maybe that's another interview for another day. So Dodgers, Lakers, Clippers and Stevie. <laughs> Well, we've come to the part of our interview. It's called Fun Facts Lightning Round or okay. Rapid Round of Fun. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And one of them was your favorite artist. So I won't ask you that. Okay. And if you desire not to answer something, feel free to say pass. Are you sure. ready for the Rapid Round of Fun? Shoot the way. Go for it. Yes, ma'am. First job. A waiter at Casa Bonita, a Mexican restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas. Your ideal car. My ideal car, uh, a Honda Pilot uh, SUV. Your favorite comfort food. Favorite comfort food, tacos. <laughs> Crunchy tacos, by the way. <laughs> the last movie you saw. The last movie I saw. Uh, what was the last movie I saw? Uh, oh, The Woman King, which was great, by the way. Yeah. You relax doing what? Listening to jazz in my recliner with the lights off. Your favorite dance song. Favorite dance song, Celebration by Cool in the Gang. <laughs> what food you eat every week, no matter what? Bacon. <laughs> Don't tell my doctor. <laughs> Workout or hit the couch? Workout. Dr. Derek. Noble. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us on Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast. Before we Thank let you. you go, share with our audience the best way for them to connect with you and to do business with you and feel free to leave all your social media handles. Thank you. Uh, best way to reach out to me is through my website. Uh, it's DerekLewisNoble.com and that's D-E-R-R-I-C-K-L-E-W-I-S-N-O-B-L-E.com. Uh, also, uh, the email on that website will take you to Derek at DerekLewisNoble.com. So that's the best way to reach me. I'm on every social media platform. I'm Dr. Derek Noble on Instagram, Dr. Derek Noble on Facebook, Dr. Derek Noble on LinkedIn. Uh, I recently deleted my Twitter, uh, my Twitter account, so you can't reach me uh, through Twitter. Uh, but uh, all the other social media uh, handles are there. Oh, and my uh, YouTube channel and my TikTok channel are also Dr. Derek Noble. So uh, reach out to me. I reach back, follow me. I follow you back. And I look forward to speaking with you and working with you. Thank you, Dr. Dare. That is a wrap. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it.